everyone, Matt here from Docs Running, and I want to welcome you to another solo episode. And wherever you might be listening to this, whether it's the Doctors Running podcast, whether it's on YouTube, whether you're viewing it, listening, doesn't really matter. Um, I figured I'd do another solo episode, and I want to catch everyone up to date on components of shoes. We talk about all kinds of different components. We talk about all kinds of different things regarding running shoes. And my concern is, and some of the feedback I've gotten is that we might be going a little quick and want to make sure that all of our viewers, listeners, what have you, are kind of up to date and understand the things we're talking about. So what I'm going to do is take this as an opportunity to, again, talk about the different components of shoes and do a really quick, I'm keeping this under 20 minutes, hopefully, view of going, hey, here's the different parts. Here's some things you might want to think about. I'm not going to dive insanely deep into each part, but just give you some ideas of what you might want to look for, depending on who you are. So I'm going to start off with one of my favorite shoes of the year, the Saucony Endorphin Pro 3. Let's just talk. This is a shoe, right? And this is a running shoe. Yes, you could walk in this, but for the most part, this is going to be a running shoe. What makes a running shoe? There's a huge amount of variety in this footwear, right? So there's stuff like traditional daily trainer stuff. You can do easy miles in. There's racing shoes like this one. Um, the racing shoes typically are lighter. Now they tend to have more aggressive foams, oftentimes plates and stuff like that. Daily trainers don't always have plates. Sometimes they do, but their shoes are going to be able to handle the impact forces associated with running. The other thing that I want to mention, there's other versions. There's track spikes, which do have some cushion, but I usually have spikes on the bottom. And then trail shoes, which have lugs in the bottom are more durable. There's just a couple of variations of this footwear type. When we talk about the components of a running shoe, that's where things get a little bit more interesting. So there's a couple different areas I want to draw your attention to first. So the back of the shoe, this is called the heel. The middle part of the shoe, this is called the midfoot. The front of the shoe is called the forefoot. It references the different parts of the foot that go into different parts of the shoe. There's also, that's kind of front to back. Up and down, you have the outsole, which not every shoe has. The outsole is kind of more durable material on the bottom that gives it a little resistance to abrasion, gives it some longevity, can also impact some things that we'll talk about. The midsole is the area where you find the foam and the cushion in a shoe. This is going to provide cushioning. This is going to provide a lot of the feel underfoot. And there's all kinds of stuff you can put in here. The upper is the thing that sits on top of the midsole. This is what holds your foot onto the platform. This and the insole provide the most contact against the foot. The insole, by the way, is a little extra piece in here. Not every shoe has a removable one. Some of them are, you know, non-removable like the Endorphin Pro 3. But the upper and the insole directly go against the foot and the upper really holds the foot onto the platform. Now let's talk about, I'm gonna start with the upper just cause I, I kind of like going there first cause oftentimes that's the first thing you'll feel when you put a shoe on. Whether you're in a store, whether you're trying it out, you slip your foot in there and even before you get up, unless you do this while you're standing, you're gonna go, hey, how's this shoe fit? So the upper is what kind of comes into that fit of a shoe. So starting in the heel, a couple different components. One of the most common things you'll hear about is a heel counter. Some shoes have this, some shoes don't. This is the rigid piece in the back that gives some structure to the back here. Some shoes that don't have it, it's very flexible. You might want a, a shoe without a heel counter if you have something called a Haglund deformity or you have some sensitivity in the area where Achilles tendon meets your heel. Some people are sensitive like myself. So if you have sensitivity there and hard counters tend to bother you, you might want something soft. For those that want a little bit better lockdown on the heel, that's the reason for the counter. It gives some structure there. It can usually wrap around the heel. It can sometimes prevent slippage side to side. So it gives it a little bit of stability. That's not quite the right word, but security. It helps secure the heel back there. Um, the heel collar is the area up here. This, you'll see some cushioning in this area sometimes. And what that is, it just wraps the heel. Okay, it's another area that adds uh, security there. Sometimes you'll have them where it's really thick and it kind of cushions the foot. Other times it's really thin to save weight and it kind of makes the heel counter more or less kind of pushy into your foot. A couple other areas you should pay attention to. Um, we'll talk about sidewalls in just a second, but you're going to get up here into the tongue. So what's a tongue? This is the thing that sits against the top of your foot. Why am I having trouble pulling this out? The tongue. Okay, so this is what sits against the top of the dorsum of your foot. It helps kind of cushion and give a little bit of security and then it also provides a little protection from the laces. The laces are the things that you can tie and adjust to either widen things up 
or kind of pull it down more and create some more security. Here's my big pitch about laces. People don't mess with these enough. And there's a whole other video I should, we should make on this where if you're having, if you feel like the laces are putting too much pressure on your foot, you can actually take these out and relace things. There's things called lace loops, lace locks. You can do the lock the heel a little bit better if your heel is slipping. You can skip spaces here. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with this, but the tongue and the laces sit against the foot to help and secure the upper. There's a couple different kinds of tongues. There's the free floating ones that generally tend to move around a little bit. And then there's these things called, this thing called gusseting where the tongue is actually locked down. That's fairly recent. And it just helps wrap the foot usually, <coughs> creates a little more security, locks the foot on the platform more, keeps this thing from sliding. We generally look for them because it's nice and it gives additional security, but not everyone has them. Uh, gusseting can put a little pressure on your arch in your foot. Is that something you don't like? You might not want that, but if you want that lockdown of the tongue, it can be a little bit important. The rest of the part of this, the midfoot, okay? So midfoot, you'll often find a lot of these things called overlays. So these additional pieces on the outer part of the upper, sometimes integrated with it, that just, again, give a little bit more structure. It's similar to a counter, except oftentimes much thinner. You'll see these things and they can give a little structure and it'll help the laces pull and add a little more security. Sometimes the overlays are good and they add more security. Sometimes they add unnecessary weight and they can rub in different spots. So just things to pay attention to. Finally, we get into the forefoot. This is where your toes are. So there's two different areas. There is the uh, forefoot area and then you get the toe box. So forefoot's kind of where you see your joints kind of go from like the base of your foot into the little toes, right? So that's right, the that kind of transition in the front of the foot, the ball of your foot sits right here. And generally you want a shoe that has enough width. You don't want something that's too narrow because it's going to kind of cramp that area. You need to be able to move that a little bit. But you also don't want something that's way too wide because then you can get a little bit of sliding back and forth and there's kind of a risk of blisters. Finding that optimal fit is going to vary on you and your foot shape. Just because a shoe says it's super wide doesn't mean that's great for you. Just because a foot shoe says it's snug and secure also doesn't mean that's great. You have to figure out what kind of size works for your foot and what you like. The final area is the toe box. Why well, this is called box. It's not always box-like, but that's a different story. This is where your toes are, right? Kind of in this area. It's the same concept this four, as the forefoot. This often will taper quite quickly just because they're trying to save weight. And that's kind of how the biomechanic, uh, the, not the biomechanics, but just the way shoes are made to kind of come up in the middle here as you can toe off. You again, want to make sure you have a little bit of wiggle room. You don't want to have things too snug unless you're doing a racing shoe for a short distance. But again, you don't also don't want it to be super sloppy where you're kind of sliding all over the place. So what's going to work for you again with an upper is going to vary. Like I said, this is what holds your foot on the platform. How you prefer that be done is going to be up to you. For me personally, I like less, a, a less of a counter. I do like a little one just because with time I've noticed, I just like a little bit of security here, but that's not always required. I like a little extra room in the toe box, not enough that my foot's sliding around, but just enough. I can wiggle the toes a little bit. And I generally prefer lighter uppers. The upper again can be super thick. If somebody has got like a water resistant upper or they want a cushion one, or they can be super thin on racing shoes. The super thin ones tend to be a little bit less durable, not always. And the super thick ones tend to be a little bit more durable, but that's not always true. The thickness of the upper again is going to be specific to you. Do you want something thick on your foot? Do you want something thin? Do you want it to get out of the way? Do you want it to be there and hold your foot? Again, depends on you. So that's the upper. Let's talk about the midsole. So again, heel, midfoot, forefoot. Each part is going to have a different function. So the heel, there's something called the bevel here. This is the upward curve. We really suggest that you have that companies have bevels here for a major reason because your calcaneus bone, your heel bone, is curved. Therefore, when you land, there's something called the heel rocker there. It's an efficient mechanism. That, that curved calcaneus bone, when you land with a heel strike, which by the way, the majority of people land on their heel, whether they're walking or running, that's normal, okay? I'm not gonna get into a foot strike debate. We can, we've can we done some several episodes on that. For those that heel strike, this is gonna help roll you forward. It's efficient. It reduces the workload on the muscles called your anterior tib muscles, the pre-tibial muscles, so that they don't have to slap down so hard. They don't have to, it eases you into a transition. So we generally suggest you find a shoe that has a bevel because it imitates that. Now, when you're starting to get into these maximal shoes, you definitely need that because the taller the shoe is, the more based on the angle, it can pitch you forward if that's not there. 
when you're looking at super thin shoes, like minimalist shoes that don't have a lot of stack height, that doesn't become as important because there's a lot less there between you and the ground. So this is called the bevel, right? The heel bevel specifically. There's some other components that are really worth talking about, and that's how stability happens. And a lot of times when people are looking at stability, the heel is the first place they look. So again, the counter can certainly add a little bit of stability by kind of wrapping the, the heel and holding it there. But the other things that we've been noticing is there's these extensions of the midsole that come up around the foot, and those are called sidewalls, okay? Different people have different names, guide rails, sidewalls. Guide rails are technically a little bit different, but sidewalls are the term that we use. And what do sidewalls do? They essentially wrap around your foot and they kind of give you a little resistance to side to side motion. It's a really awesome concept called guidance that we've been really liking because it kind of helps kind of guide your foot down instead of kind of rolling side to side if you have that kind of issue. We prefer that there be sidewalls on both sides of the foot because we want, regardless of where you go, to just help ease you forward. It's different than a post, but these more and more companies are doing this to add a little bit of guidance. I would almost say stability, but not quite. It just helps guide your foot forward rather than forcing it. Now, on that note, as you start transitioning into the midfoot, and sometimes these are the heel, in the heel, there's something called a medial post. Very rarely will you see this lateral. So posting refers to a different density of foam that's most commonly on the medial side. The Endorphin Pro 3 does not have this. And you'll see sometimes discolored foam here. You'll see kind of a raised bump here or something like that. And that's a different, usually firmer density of foam for, compared to everything else. And what is function is, is that when you land, if you roll inward, it's supposed to kind of resist some of that motion, help you control it and keep you going forward. That's typically how stability is defined. If that would be some, if a shoe has that, it's considered a stability shoe. These are not as common now. You'll still see them in stability shoes, but that's why we've been talking more about things like sidewalls and guidance and sole width, which I'll talk about in a second, because there's other ways to create stability beyond the traditional method of, hey, let's put this rigid piece here. Sometimes people like that, which is totally fine. It's not as common. There's more variety now. That's where things like guide rails, where you've got kind of a density of foam that goes along the midsole. You've got posting. You know, you've got a lot of different methods now, but that's one method that some people do really, really well with. There's nothing wrong with it. Just some people do well. Some people don't do well. Now, as we keep moving forward, so... I mentioned that efficient mechanism. So we talk about this all the time. The heel rocker is the first one, that curved calcaneus that efficiently rolls you forward and kind of reduces the energy required. There's the In this shoe, there's not really a mechanism for this here, except at the ankle joint up higher, there's something called the ankle rocker. That's why when you're at the midfoot, things need to support you well enough that you can, that tibia can keep rolling forward over the foot. So that's the ankle rocker. It's kind of hard to imitate that outside of having a rockered sole. And so what's a rockered sole? You see this curve right here, right? So you've got the curved heel, curved forward. That whole continuum is called a rocker bottom shoe. Now, we're not talking about some of the old, like, like Skechers rocker bottom and stuff like that. These are a little bit less extreme than that. But it's really important, especially as the soles get thicker, to have some of that. And it's because if a stiff shoe doesn't have that rocker, it's going to feel really uncomfortable to roll forwards, right? Because if you have a flexible shoe, that's fine because your toes will flex and you extend and you'll go forward. But shoes that don't have that flexibility, especially ones that have a plate, you need that rocker to help roll you forwards. And that brings me into the last part here. This is called the forefoot rocker, which is imitating, you know, forefoot rocker in the foot is how your toes extend as you roll forward. It's an efficient way to transfer your weight forwards and it helps your calf push off and load you forward and gets your center of body, center of mass over your foot. If that's too stiff, that creates a problem. That's more work you got to do. And often people that the shoes are too stiff or that, that don't have that will describe it as, oh, it's very stiff. It's hard to get over this. So shoes that have flexibility here. So you'll often see flex screws and they should flex in this area. That'll just allow it to bend here so you can roll over that. If they don't have that flexibility, you're going to need something called a forefoot rocker. Now, I want to clarify this. So from my understanding, this used to be called toe spring, but now because it's just that upward spring of the toes. Now it sounds like we're defining that as the toe spring is how much your toes are held in extension as it goes up. And this is considered the forefoot rocker. Somebody tell me if I'm wrong on that because I just started seeing that change. 
I still sometimes refer to this as toe spring because it's that upper curve. But the goal of this, again, is with the shoe that's too stiff to help provide a little extra levering and roll forward off the toes. Again, important for shoes that are stiff or high stack. So that's kind of looking at the midsole. The cushioning here, that's the foam, will oftentimes really determine the resiliency, the bounce of a shoe. So sometimes you'll have a firm sole. Sometimes you'll have a soft sole. It, which one's better is going to depend on what your body likes and what you're looking for. The Endorphin Pro 3 has uh, full length P-Bat, P-Bat, p, -bat, p, -bat, p foam here. It's very resilient. It's softer. It bounces. Not the best if you need a ton of stability, although there's some other mechanisms we'll talk about in this shoe that are a great example, but it's definitely bouncy. It can go pretty fast because it's so light. Other shoes will be a little heavier, still have softer foam, provide more cushioning, which is a whole different conversation. But the, the purpose of the midsole, again, is to provide protection from the ground. How much you need, that's going to depend on you. Shoes that are very close to the ground are considered minimal shoes. They used to be considered racing flats, but we don't have a lot of shoes like that anymore. Some that have more moderate amounts, which generally moderate is considered like 20 to 30 millimeters of stack height, like in the heel. Um, and then once you start getting above 30, that's a little bit more in that maximal super stack height realm. And things are getting even over 40 now. So that's midsole, that's midsole heights. That's what we're talking about there. Uh, heel drop refers to the dis difference between the height of the heel and the height of the forefoot. Oftentimes there's usually, the most common thing I see is an eight millimeter drop. It used to be 12. Now it's like eight to four. You'll see shoes that are zero drop. You'll see shoes that are negative drop, but they kind of vary from zero all the way up to 12 now. How much drop you need is gonna depend on your Achilles, your calf length and what you can tolerate and what's comfortable for you. One is not necessarily better than the other. It just, again, depends on the individual, their preferences, and their running mechanics. Now, let's get to the sole. This is where we get, especially the outsole, this is where things we often talk about, and I think some people get lost. So outsole, outsole durability. It is very normal to land on the posterior lateral heel. People come to me all the time going, oh, I'm wearing this out, is this bad? No, it's normal. It's normal to land on the posterior lateral heel roll down and sometimes pivot off the first toe. You kind of add any extremes of motions. We have different names for that, but that's a different video. So again, heel, midfoot, forefoot of the outsole or the sole. There's different widths that we like to talk about. So generally a wider shoe or a wider sole tends to be a little bit more unstable, stable. Why? Because when you land, if there's more foam in one direction, you try to roll that way, it provides a little bit of resistance. That extends the, the amount that extends beyond the foot is called sole flare. So if the midsole extends beyond here like this, that's a lateral flare. If it goes in the inner part, it's called a medial flare. Those can be really great for providing some resistance to motion, some guidance and stability. They can also not be so good if it creates, if it's too stiff and you land here and it creates an early landing and pivots you forward. Where that's going to work for you is going to depend on where you land, the softness of the sole. I know there's some lateral flare here, but again, with the bevel, that kind of takes it out of the picture. So that's flare. When we talk about widths, generally you want things to be a, a little bit wider than your foot because it creates an inherently stable ride. The area that we often talk about is the width of the heel. A lot of companies will make a very narrow sole at the, he at the midfoot. What did I just say? The, the midfoot width. So a wider midfoot is inherently more stable. A lot of companies will argue, hey, because a lot of people don't put a lot of pressure there or they don't roll on the medial side, we can take that out and save weight. I would argue there's better ways to do that. And Sockney did a great job because there's a gap here. You can see the plate, but they still put some stuff on that medial side. And what that does, if you start rolling in, you need a little bit help controlling some of that motion inwards. This provides just a little extra res resistance and it also creates an inherently more stable ride. So I personally look for a filled in midfoot. Other people that don't need that, you can look for the area cut out. That's fine. But that's when we talk about midfoot width. That's why it's so important to me because it adds an element of stability and guidance. Finally, the forefoot width, right? So again, when we talk about forefoot stability, people don't realize that the metatarsals and that end there, you have to have muscles to control that. Some people have great stability there, some people don't. This is the area you're looking for if you land up front or going what's a lot of the traction like up here, just because you often pivot off this stuff. So again, a little wider forefoot tends to have a little bit better um, guidance and stability, but it's also a place people will commonly land. The last piece that I want to mention is traction. So traction refers to a lot of these grooves here and how well the shoe is gripping the road. 
or the trail. So trail shoes will generally have these lugs on the bottom. So these additional grippy things that aren't the best for road, but they'll grip into different things. Road shoes tend to have a little bit sometimes, but less because again, you generally don't need as grippy as the stuff on road. And how much traction you need is gonna depend on the conditions. If you've got wet road, you might need a little bit more traction. You might need to see, hey, are there these little lugs on the bottom here? If you're going on snow or trail or dirt, stuff like that, you're probably going to want to shoe with more lugs, like a trail shoe, because it's going to give you the security you need when you're you know, going on uneven terrain and going on soft surfaces. You need that because, again, and I didn't really didn't know this until I started testing trail shoes, that provides a lot of extra security. If you don't have that, you're going to slip. That might be, not to scare people, it might be an ankle sprain, might be falling. So having the outsole match the terrain you're going to use is really, really important. There's some things I missed with this, but that's a quick overview of the different components of most of the po components of running shoes. We'll do some other episodes and some of the other major components here, but I hope that was helpful. And I hope that brings some, some people up to speed or is a review for some people so that it keeps you up to date with some of the stuff we're talking about. Cause we want to bring you along, want to educate you. And I also thought the reason I should do the anatomy of a shoe is cause I'm a professor and I teach anatomy, but also because we want to educate people. We want to help you understand what you're putting on your feet because it's important. If you don't know how are you going to make educated decisions and that's what we want. So hope that was helpful. I'm going to encourage you to continue following us. And we're really continuing to try to move in that educational way. We really want to help people we want to make interesting content. So if there's anything that you are interested in any components, like, Hey, you talk about this a lot. Can you do a deeper dive into this component? Please tell us. So comment below any interesting components that you want us to talk a little bit about that we a little bit more about that we haven't talked about before. Comment below follow us follow us on the different social media channels. We've always got stuff coming out, you'll see different variations of not only the videos that we're posting, but all the posts and stuff on the website in different areas. And we, as always, appreciate you following along. That is what I think this year I am most thankful, not only for the amazing team that I have at Doctors Running, but also I'm thankful for all of you that follow us on this journey. And I really hope you find this helpful and I hope you're running, enjoying it. And I hope you have a great end of year or beginning of year, wherever, whenever you're listening or watching or whatever you're doing with this video.